is satisfied until you get back. Amen. Amen. Well, we're glad to have Dr. Ruckman. Appreciate some of your trying to make me feel at home. <laughs> All right, if you have a Bible, let's go to Isaiah chapter 66. Body truth for the one body mystery and all that, you know. Isaiah 66, verse 2. Now, if you came here this morning expecting to hear something real deep, some great prophetic subject, you're going to get a big disappointment this morning. I'm going to give you some milk this morning. And, uh, you know, Bob Jonas Sr. told me one time, he said, you know, he said, people won't always uh, follow you in the strong emphasis that you put on things. And he said, you know, sometimes it's a good idea to remember that uh, milk is always good for almost anybody. Anybody can drink milk. Uh, Lester Olaf wouldn't agree with that, but that's beside the point. And uh, so sometimes you just need some milk. And I'm going to talk to you here this morning about the most unlikely subject that you'd possibly expect to hear in a Bible conference of Bible believers who've been studying the Word of God for years and years and years. But I'm going to talk to you this morning on the profound subject of what to do with the Bible. That's profound. <laughs> what to do with the Bible. And uh, you say, well, I know all this stuff, Ruckman. Well, maybe you do and maybe you don't. And maybe you know it and maybe you don't practice it. But we're going to talk about what to do with the Bible. Now, Isaiah chapter 66, verse 2 there, the Lord's talking. And he's talking about who he'll have respect to and who he won't have respect to. The Lord says in that passage, he's going to look to a certain kind of man. Now, whether you're that certain kind of man or not, but he tells you there what certain kind of man it is, so if you don't know, uh, you, can, you can find out. And he says, to this man will I look, he says. And then he says, what kind of a man is it? He says, to a man that's of a, a humble or a poor and contrite spirit, and trembleth at my words. That's what he says. Uh, Christ says uh, one time in the New Testament, he says, I thank thee, Father, Lord of heaven, thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and reveal them unto babes, even so, Father, it seemed good in thy sight. And uh, people, you know, I don't care how long you've read the Bible, how much you believe the Bible, how much you know about the Bible, uh, those things there need to be taken to heart, and people don't take them to heart. You want God to look at you and have respect upon you and take time out with you and tend to you? Okay, you, you, here's what you gotta do. You gotta have a humble, contrite spirit and you have to tremble at his word. I don't know one person out of 50 America trembles at his word. Bible tells you a number of things. The Bible says, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? The Bible says, you should be witness unto me. And you don't. Do you tremble? The Bible says, uh, in everything give thanks. Do you do that? You don't do it. Well, you don't, do you tremble when you don't do it? People don't tremble. They don't pay attention to that book. Our Bible says, wives, uh, be in subject, be obedient to your own husband, the word of God be not blasphemed. You ladies worry about the word of God being blasphemed? I don't think so. You take, uh, you take America, America doesn't fear God. That's what's all wrong in America. They're afraid of Russia. They're afraid of nukes. They're afraid of the NACP. They're afraid of the news media. They're afraid of CBS and NBC and ABC and the Gannett newspapers. They don't fear God. God says, you want me to pay attention? You'll tremble. You should have shaken something beside cancer and running out of money. Amen, 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 and amen for you too. Um, people don't amen me. I amen myself. Amen, Ruckman. That's good preaching. Get them. Sick them. That's how you encourage yourself. See, you psych yourself up. That's to do in sports, you know. Number one, number one, you know. You've got to psych yourself into it sometimes. Now, here's the first thing. Uh, you buy a Bible, supposedly, you buy a Bible to use it, not to display it. I mean, some of my students carry Bibles as big as a Detroit yellow section of the commercial ads. Telephone book, you know, on the yellow section, and that's okay. You make you a strong Christian. You get strong carrying that weight around. <laughs> <clears throat> but the book is not meant to be displayed. The book is meant to be used. You say, I know that. Do you use it? 
See, that's the thing, not to display it. Did you know America had 19 million Bibles in it back in 1936? And 1945, it had 1945, it had 36 million Bibles in it. I don't know what you got now. If it had 36 million then, it probably have 100 million Bibles in it now. That's almost one Bible for every two people in this country. Wouldn't you think a country that's soaked down with Bibles like that be a different kind of country than what this one is? It's why in this country a different kind of country than what it is, because it just has the book for display, but it doesn't use it. I mean, you come in the house, where's your Bible? Right over there. I don't know where to find it. I've been over there for ten years. <laughs> you take George Bernard Shaw, when he, when, he was, when he died and they auctioned off furniture in his house, you know they had to auction off a Bible and a, and a coffee table together? Because the Bible had been sitting on the coffee table for so long, the cupboard stuck to the table. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a display. <laughs> See, I mean, if all the, if all the dust from all the unopened Bibles in America would be knocked off, you'd have a smoke screen as big as Vesuvius going on. Uh, everybody wants a means of grace beside the Bible because it convicts. You take these uh, dumb Catholics, and I say that with charity. Uh, you take these dumb Catholics, they think the sacraments are means of grace. Well, it's, uh, going to Mass, you know, and popping something in your tongue, that ain't going to get you under conviction. Watch you write Ezekiel chapter 16. Watch you write Ezekiel 23. You want to get a conviction? Read Proverbs 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. You want to get tore up? Spend a little time in First Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians. Sacraments ain't going to get you under conviction. That's why people like them. They like those means of grace because they don't upset them. And that Bible is an upsetting book. You say, well, I'll just stay away from it, and if I don't know any better, no, that won't work. Ignorance is no excuse for breaking the law. I mean, haven't you had a patrolman pull you over? Haven't you ever been through this scene where the patrolman says, uh, uh, did you see that stop sign back there? No, I didn't see it. Well, let's go back and look at it. <laughs> you ever been in that one? And you go back there, and he don't find you, see, because you, you, you didn't see it, see, or he finds you because you could have seen it but didn't see it, see? Now, you folks aren't fooling your Bibles. I know what you think. I know exactly what you think. You think if you just keep the thing shut, you won't be held accountable for what's in it. <laughs> you could have found out what's in it if you use it, but folks don't use it. Back in the Crimean War, a Britisher got shot up pretty bad, was dying. He called one of his buddies there and said, he said, I say, old boy, he said, give me a, will you get me a drop? Will you get me a drop before I die? And he went over there and pulled out the soldier's canteen to give him a drop of water, and he said, not that, not that, not that, get the Bible, give me a drop out of that, that's what a dying soldier needs. That's what you need. Canteen ain't going to do you any good. Water keep you alive, you know, another 30 minutes, something like that. If you're going to die, you're going to need the book. Use the book. The book is to be used, not just to be bought. Uh, and the book is to be read. That's the next thing. The book is to be read. You say, how do you supposed to read it? Read it through like you read any other book. Any other book, you pick it up, you read it clear through, pick up the Bible and read it through, cover to cover, including the cover. The book is supposed to be read. And if you're well, not reading it, then there's something wrong. Let me, let me ask you something. Why is it that the only two things in this earth that ever make a mistake have to wait in line for the rest of your junk? I mean, uh, your husband makes mistakes, don't he? Your kids don't make mistakes, don't they? I mean, there's something wrong with the church, isn't it? There's something wrong with the preacher. There's something wrong with the evangelists. There's something wrong with the deacons. There's something wrong with the school. There's something wrong with the country. Amen? There's something wrong with your car. You say amen to that, can't you? There's something wrong with your car. There's something wrong with your job. There's something wrong with your body. Well, there are two things that there's nothing wrong with, and that's God and the Bible. But why do they have to wait in line? Why does the book have to wait? You get through the rest of this stuff. The rest of this stuff all got holes in it. People strange. They don't read that Bible. Why, why talk about reading that Bible? Uh, all, why, why America, has, America for, for the number of Bibles it has, has the biggest nation of blockheads in this world. They asked, they asked a bunch of kids, high school kids, they quizzed them on the Bible, you know, and I got the answers back from the quiz they took. Wildest stuff you ever saw in your life. What a paraffin. What's paraffin? Paraffin is an order of angels. <laughs> they got the cherubim, the seraphim, and the paraffin. <laughs> They wanted to know what a synagogue was. It was a rich sex of Jews, you know. David killed Goliath with a catapult. The wise men bought Jesus Christ myrrh, frankens, no, myrrh, bought him myrrh and gold and frankfurters. <laughs> they get it all messed up. Who was Methuselah? He was the snake in the Garden of Eden. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, wild, crazy stuff, man. Look there, Mom, Mom, that curly lady got up in church and gave a testimony. She said, oh, glory to God, hallelujah, I'm just so happy tonight. I'm just happy as if I was the bosom of Beelzebub. <laughs> and they said, Beelzebub? And she said, well, one of them patriarchs. <laughs> I mean, you take Americans, they don't know that book. Uh, like I say, I'm not going to embarrass you with it. I'm not going to make you stand up and quote a verse of Scripture, but I could... I could sure raise Cain. Folks talking about being split in the congregation. I never split in the congregation, but I sure could have split them if I wanted to. I mean, suppose I just have you ladies get up right now and give me five verses on raising children. <clears throat> Wouldn't you be in a flat-footed mess? You don't even know where they are, let alone quote them. I know what I know. I know how women say they say. Well, I think I did a pretty good job raising my children, brother. Up here, I know, I know. Just like any atheist. You know, you know how they live over in Russia and China? They live without any, they live over there in Russia and China without any reference to what God said. You know how Americans live? The same way. Without any reference to what God said. You fellas right here so hung up on money. If I ask you to stand up right now and quote me five verses of Scripture, what the Bible says about money, could you quote them? And this is a Bible believing church. You got a Bible believing pastor. If you can't quote them, you imagine the condition the Episcopalian's in? <laughs> if you Bible believing Baptists don't know what you're doing, you reckon they know what they're doing? Getting awful quiet in here, preacher, early in the morning. Getting quiet at a turkey farm on Thanksgiving afternoon. <clears throat> you know what the trouble is? I'll tell you what the trouble is. Some of you are not reading your Bible. You're not reading your Bible. Ought to be read through. Ought to be read through. Why, you can surprise Americans uh, ten times in it with just simple little old things. Like I, I read the other day in the Sword of the Lord where, where if you send me and you can get Hiles Study Bible and you get Hiles Preaching Bible where every other page is a blank page. Everybody write me in to get one real quick. Well, this magical Bible, I guess you have a Bible like Jack Hiles Bible, then you're going to really win the soul to Christ, you know. <laughs> get to see every other page. Listen, my study Bible is a Cambridge every other page, blank I've had since 1959. I wonder why they don't give me any breaks like that. <laughs> <laughs> and publicity. I never bought it with me. It's got too many notes in it. It's got 40,000 notes in it. I'd be afraid to leave. I'd be afraid to lose the thing. If I lost the thing, I'd lose a life work. That thing is practically worn out. It's the fifth Bible I've worn out. The fifth one. How many you worn out? Let me tell you something, brethren. A thumbprint on a Bible cover is more important than a footprint on the moon. He said, where do you get that? Do you get that from Romans chapter 10? Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven to bring it down? Who shall ascend the deep to bring it down? But what say it? The word is nigh thee. In your heart, in your mouth, got it right there in your hand. You ought to read it. You ought to read it through from cover to cover, including the cover. Or right, there's something else you ought to do with a Bible. If you have a Bible, you ought to memorize one verse a day. Don't tell me you can't memorize one verse a day. Now, with something like five verses a day, that might be a little more difficult. Going to school sometimes, we make them memorize three or four verses, you know, for a test and that kind of thing. But one verse a day, surely you can memorize one verse a day. How about rejoice evermore? Don't that take a lot of work? Rejoice evermore? In everything give thanks for this will of God and Christ Jesus concerning you? My God shall follow your need through his riches and glory of Christ Jesus. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. He that sows the flesh, let the flesh reap corruption. He that sows the spirit, of the spirit of everlasting life. You're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be the spirit of Christ dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. We know that all things work together for good to them who love God, them who call according to his purpose. Ask you shall receive. Seek you shall find, knock and shall be opened to you. Whatever you want, uh, believe in, uh, when you pray, believing you shall receive, you shall receive, uh, in everything with, uh, supplication, thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God that passes all his times, keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Thou will keep him in perfect peace of mind to say upon thee, there is no temptation taking you, but the common of man. God is faithful. Get the thing down. When, when that devil comes to Christ and starts that stuff, he says, it is written, pow, it is written, pow, it is written, pow, and puts the stuff out. Folks, a lot of proof text method doesn't do anything. Sure it does. It tears them all to pieces. <laughs> I've sat down in a, in, a, in, a, in a booth after a service at night eating some junk food with some Christian, you know how you do, and sitting around there, and there was an unsaved lawyer sitting right next to me, and his 
girlfriend wanted to have me witness to him, so I began to witness to him, and he'd get he'd kind of nervous, you know, and he'd laugh and say, well, what about this, you know? What about where Cain get his wife? And I'd say, well, that's easy, and flip over there, like that. And he'd say, yeah, yeah that's pretty good, you know. Well, how would all those, uh, animal, how all those animals get in the ark? I'd say, well, that's easy, and flip, like that. And he'd say, yeah, but what? I'd say, yeah, but anybody can figure that out, like that. And about the fourth time, he reached over and put his hand on the Bible and said, no, 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 no. Closing it with his hand. You know, I was doing that guy, I was just cutting his guts out with that book. That Bible said the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharp in a two-edged sword. You want to memorize that book, how can you use it if you don't memorize it? Come on out. One a day, one a day, one verse a day. You know how many that is in a year? 365 verses. You know how much that is in 10, ten years? 3,650 verses. 3,000, that's one-tenth of the whole book. Only has about 31,000 verses in it. In 10 years, you can memorize a tenth of the Bible. Say 1,200 pages, you've memorized 120 pages. The thing is, you don't do it. You don't memorize them, you don't read them. Now, I myself, you know, I've, I've only made an effort to memorize, oh, maybe four or five passages I use in preaching, and the rest of what I've got a hold of that, I, that I've memorized and I've learned, I haven't learned from, uh, from making a real effort to memorize. I've never sat down to see what I could actually do in trying to memorize a thing. What I do is I just read through from cover to cover, and read through and read through, and by the time I've been through it 105 times, some of it begins to stick. I'm through 105 times now to uh, Ezekiel chapter uh, 23. And my mind isn't, it isn't as good as you think it is, you know, folks. Oh, you got a telegraphic or, you know, a telepathic or something, you know, photographic memory and all that stuff. No, no, I'm not like that. No, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm very, I'm very slow learner. Really. Honest to God. Really am. And my memory isn't too good either. Folks, so you memorize this, that? No, it isn't too good. It isn't that good. I, I'm, I, I'm not photo, photogenic to memory. I can't recall the page, you know, and all that stuff on the page. I can't do that. And uh, you take, I remember, I can learn something if it's on paper, but my memory is very poor. I don't know where, you take people, I've been to this church, how long been up here, six, seven years? How long? Ten years, there we go, one of them things. I don't know the name of anybody in this church. Oh, his name. I can't remember the name of his wife or even his daughters. Isn't that something? Folks say they got a good memory. This isn't very good. I went to Beach and Vicks Church every year for 17 years. He had me in every year for 17 years. They don't have me here anymore. <laughs> in 17 years there, I couldn't tell you the name of anybody in that congregation except Billy and Billy Bartlett and uh, almost forgot Larry. <laughs> Larry and Bill Bartlett. That's all I know in that congregation. I know about that congregation. I have most embarrassing. Get out of an airplane in an airport and some guy come up. Well, hello, Brother Ruckman. Well, how do <laughs> you remember me, don't you? Uh, oh, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm uh, Bill Smith, you know, Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Oh, yeah, yeah, how you doing? I don't know the guy from Adam, man. I might have stayed in his house a week during the meeting. <laughs> That's an embarrassing thing. See, now, some of you don't have that trouble, do you? No, you don't. So what's your alibi? I mean, folks, you memorize, you got your social security number memorized, your bank account number memorized, your zip code memorized, your area code memorized, your house number memorized, your license plate memorized. You don't know any scripture? <laughs> don't kid me, boy. And listen, don't you get the job to see the uh, Christ and try to kid him. I know, I know, listen, I know, I know some young people, they, they can sing you the song, uh, the, the lyrics to a half a dozen of the world's popular tune right now and can't quote ten verses of Scripture out of the book of Proverbs. And the book of Proverbs is written to keep you from your sins. Isn't that something? You're supposed to memorize the book, learn the book, read the book through from cover to cover. Like I say, my memory isn't like that. I've got what they call recall memory. And my memory, my, my uh, storage system is like a big silo, a big grain elevator with all kinds of stuff plugged down in it. And when I have to go for something, I have to reach back in there and pull it out, you see. And sometimes it takes a long time to pull it out. Because it isn't organized. I'm, uh, my mind is complete disorganized. There's no organization to it at all. I don't learn anything by two and two is four and one is five and four is nine. I can't learn that way. Uh, 
I, 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 I was permanently ruined by Buddhism when I was over in the Orient and studying Prajna and meditation and Paramitra Sutras and all that stuff and attaining Samadhi. I get a thing by a leap of consciousness. I get a thing by going over and over and over until whoop, I get the revelation. And then over and over and over and then whoop, I get the revelation. I can't figure anything logically. My mind is in logic. I get on the plane and pick up these books, you know, these little problems, you know. There are ten people in the room. Three of them are shorter than five of them, and two of them are taller than three of them. And if one of them is the same size as four, oh my God, man, the hell. I, mean, I, 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 can't, I can't figure the thing out. I can't figure the thing out. I just take them and just throw them away. I can't do nothing with that thing. You know, you know all these things, you're traveling, you're traveling 40 miles an hour to a place 200 miles off, and a guy passes you 60 miles an hour at a place 150 miles off, and if you pass 40 miles an hour, oh, the blazes with it, man, I can't, I can't do nothing with it. I can't do nothing with it. Now, some of you can figure that stuff out, see, but I can't. And my mind's kind of like a big old grain elevator with a whole lot of stuff shoved down in it someplace, and I have to reach down there and grab something and pull that thing out. Sometime it's delayed. I mean, I'll be... I, I have been preaching, you know, and right in the middle of the service, in the middle of the preaching service, I have suddenly said, uh, Blonde, Blondine, and the audience look at you like, you know, what, what's the matter with you? <laughs> and the thing is, for about a week before I got in the pulpit, I'd been teaching up there in classroom, and I'd been teaching the Second or Third Crusade, and Richard the Lionhearted was taken captive by Leopold, the Duke of Austria, returning from the Crusade. When he's up there in the tower, a lute player came below the bottom and played a lute to get him to stick his head out the window. And the question is, what was the lute player's name? <laughs> you know, after a while, it gets, you have a hard time remembering where your shoelaces are, man. <laughs> Folks talk about the mind professor, you know, you wind up the cap and put the clock out and that kind of thing. And that comes from, I mean, how are you going to remember somebody that shook your hand in a meeting in Las Vegas, California, when you've got to remember that the modern era began with the Peace of Westphalia in 1654, or was it 1546? Yeah. See? And after a while, you know, there's stuff you can't bring the stuff up. Now, that stuff was all jammed down my head, though only the Lord knows where all that stuff is. And it gets down there, and you know, when I, have, when I want to get a, uh, get a hold of something, a fact or something, I have to reach down through all that mess, you know, and pull it up. And sometimes it's a long time coming up. Sometimes it doesn't surface for two or three days. I have had them where they didn't surface for three weeks. And I'll start, I'll send the messenger down through that thing, and he'll cram my those papers down there and come back up. And three weeks later, I'll be in the middle of a conversation at a table, and, boy, oh, that guy's name is... Well, things surfaces. <laughs> and folks say, you're nuts. I know it. I know it. I know it. It takes all kinds to make a world, you know. If I can put up with you, you can put up with me. <laughs> all right, now here's the next thing you've got to do. You've got to think about what you read. Think about it. Meditate on it. Ask yourself, what in here is personal? What in here is for me? Ask yourself, what's shocking about this statement? Ask yourself, what is the main thing here in what I just read? Can I go back and find the main thing I just read? Is this all, you know, gray area, or is there something here really important I need to get? Now, you need to get a hold of that thing. Ask yourself, is this personal? Is this for me? Who's talking? To whom is he talking? What's he trying to get across? Is this thing a shocking statement? What's shocking about this statement? You saw the Bible just a dull book, nothing shocking about it. Listen, the Bible is the most shocking book you ever got your hands on. You take a little thing like this. Oh, the, she brought a good work on me. The poor you always have with you. You can do a good work any time you want to, but me you don't always have with you. That's Christ talking at the table. And he's talking with Mary there. He's talking with uh, Mary, and she just anointed him, and one of the disciples complaining and saying, how come this uh, thing here, this alabaster box of this precious ointment, why wasn't this thing sold and given to the poor? You know what Christ said? Christ said, don't worry about the poor. You've always got them with you. You always help them out. But you don't have a chance to help me out. Do you know that's shocking? Do you ever think about that? Think about that a minute. Think about a fellow table saying, never mind the poor people. Take care of me. <laughs> that's a shocker, man. Do you ever think about it? Folks just read through and they don't think. Now, if you thought that, if you ever thought for a minute that Jesus Christ wasn't God, did you ever stop thinking what a terrible thing it was he said? 
He said, oh, the poor folks, don't worry about them. Give me the money. I'm more important than they are. That's what he said. The poor you always have with you, but you don't always have me. What a thing to say, man. Well, listen, if he wasn't God in the flesh, he was the most egotistical character that ever lived. He said, you want to think about those things. Those are shockers. Did you ever, did you ever see that thing over there in, the, in, the, in the Matthew chapter 11? Where he's in Matthew chapter 11, you know what he says? Matthew chapter 11, he says, uh, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke and learn of me, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light, and you shall find rest for your souls. You ever start thinking about what a truly shocking thing that thing is? You saw just a little old statement. little old statement, nothing. That thing says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now think a minute. Whoever could say anything like that gave by to believe it. You didn't hear Buddha say, come to me and I'll give you rest. He said, meditation will give you rest. Muhammad didn't say, come to me and I'll give you rest. He said, my teaching will give you rest. Whoever said, come to me and I personally will give you rest and made the invitation open to anybody? Nobody. Nobody. Do you have any of your doubts about who Jesus Christ was? You need to think about those things. Those things are shockers. That Bible is a shocking book. You know, you know what a, you know a periscope for? That's for looking over. You know what a telescope for? That's for looking up. You know what a microscope's for? That's for looking down. You know what the Bible can do? It can look over and look up and look down, and then it's a mirror where you can see backwards, and it's binoculars where you can see forwards. And if you want to, if you want to see all the angles, you get your Bible. Never mind about science. They're way behind time. They never do get caught up. You take a thing and uh, think about the thing. Do you realize that your uh, body that gives you so much trouble, that's what gives us trouble, is the flesh. If the flesh gives us so much trouble, you know your, your body is controlled by your soul? You know what your soul is controlled by? It's controlled by your spirit. You know what that Bible is? The words that I speak to you, Christ says, they are spirit. They are life. Now listen, if that thing is food for the spirit and strengthens a man's spirit, and a man's spirit can strengthen his soul, and the soul controls the body, how much time should you spend in that book? Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way, he says, by taking heed thereto according to thy word. That's the business. You need to think about what you read. All right, that isn't all. There's something else you ought to do with that book. You ought to pray to understand it. Nothing is dumber than a man depending upon a Greek lexicon or a Hebrew lexicon to help him understand the Word of God. The Word of God is a supernatural book. And if I go to some Greek scholar or Hebrew scholar and say, I want to have you uh, tell me what this passage means, him picking that book up and look at it, if he doesn't believe it, he's just like a blind man being asked to judge an art exhibit. He can't get it. He can't get it. The answer of thy word giveth light, it giveth understanding of the simple. The words that I speak to you, they are truth, they are life. I thank thee, Father, thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and reveal them unto babes, even so, Father, it seemed good in my sight. Now, we teach Hebrew and Greek down in our school, but we don't teach Hebrew and Greek down at that school to understand the Bible. Our students have an understanding, boy, when you study Hebrew and Greek, that isn't to help you understand the Bible. That even what it's taught for. We teach you to shut the mouth. These smart alecks are always messing with the Bible. Somebody said, well, if, it be, if, it, if these new translations are clear, oh, cut it out, cut it out. I've been in the air down there in Pensacola for 25 years, and about two times a year for 25 years, you know what I've been telling those people over that radio? I've been saying, if you want to write me or phone me, write me and phone me anytime, and I want to have you show me just one thing you found in your newer, clear translation that I can't find the King James Bible in 20 seconds. Amen. And in 25 years, nobody's ever phoned me, nobody's ever written a letter. You've got a living Bible, and it's so much clearer, is it? Show me something after service this morning. I'll be available. Show me one thing you found in there. I couldn't find that King James Bible in 20 seconds or five seconds. They'll lie to you. They'll lie to you. I said, this is so much clearer and plain, you can get more out. No, you can't. You don't get stuff out of there just because it's plain. I, I'll give you one. I'll give you one. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. You understand that verse? You sure you do? <laughs> I can do all things 
through Christ would strengthen me. If it can strengthen you in the Lord, you can do it. Give up a bad habit, you can do it. Live with only God to take care of you, your health shot. Hey, man, you can't understand that verse with Hebrew and Greek. I don't care how clear you wrote that verse, you couldn't understand that verse until you've been through it. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. You can have an operation out of anesthesia, can you? Have a limb whacked off with no anesthesia? You see how people are? I mean, they say, you know, you know, the Greek and Hebrew make it clear, listen this and verse in there, you couldn't get no matter how they were translated. If God Almighty didn't show you, you're going to have to pray, pray. Say, Lord, I'll tell you what I pray. I pray, Lord, open my eyes that I might behold wondrous things out of thy law. And I, I, I'm not bragging. I'll tell you right now, I get stuff out of every Greek and Hebrew scholar they couldn't find if they lived for 50 more years. You say, why? Because the Lord will show it to you. I mean, the, the whom shall it reveal sound doctrine? Those that are weaned, for, those that are, are, are on milk, those that are weaned from the breast, babies, babies. I thank thee, Father, I'll hid these things for wise and prudent, and reveal them unto babies, even so, Father, it seemed good in thy sight. Are these people that profess to, you know, have so much insight in the Word of God, and yet don't believe it's the Word of God? No use to ask them for an opinion about a thing, you know what you're talking about. Right. Fellow said another day, you know, he said, you know, he said, uh, well, I, 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 I just don't see how you, you can believe, you know, that uh, back there in the Old Testament, that mule, that jackass, spoke like a man. And I told him, well, I've heard a lot of men talk like jackasses. I don't know what the difference is. I mean, uh, some fellow says, well, I just can't believe it. He made water out of wine. Well, that's easier to make water out of nothing, ain't it? I mean, back there in Genesis chapter 1, he made water out of nothing. You think that's any more, you think that's any easier, you know, making water out of wine? People got funny ideas about those things. I mean, pray and ask God to show you what the thing means. That's what I do. When a fellow said one time, man, he said, don't you leave that Bible? He said, no. He said, I don't. He said, well, why don't you leave it alone then? And he says, because it won't leave me alone. <laughs> That's the truth. That's the truth. You know why they keep messing with that King James Bible and messing with that King James Bible? Because it messes with them. Can't you figure that out? They got a persecution complex about that book. That book persecutes them. They keep fooling with it and fooling with it and fooling with it. Now, you know me, when I write, you know, I give them a pretty hard time. And people that had never met me, they figure the first time they meet me, I'm going to be six feet five, breathing fire with filed teeth, you know. It's always a, oh yeah, it's always a disappointment. You know, see a little fella get up there and they think to themselves, is that where that stuff's coming from? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a, it's a Pac-Man. Down, down home we call it Ruckman. It's a little fella that runs around the board and eats up college professors and spits them out. And when I write, you know how I write, I'll get them there, and I'll, I'll, I'll be coming along there, and I'll be typing away, and I'll sit this thing here, and it says, and the, and the servant gave Rebecca and put an earring upon her face. And I read, ear, ear, earring upon her face. And then I pick up RSV, nose mule. New King James, nose mule. Just like the National Council Churches. Truman Dollar, A.V. Henderson, Curtis Hudson. Write him with the liberals, boy, just like that. Tell him I said so, no skin off my nose. And go for ASB, no jewel. New ASB, no jewel. Kittles, Hebrew text, no jewel. Young's Analytical Concordance, no jewel. <laughs> Delich's Hebrew County and Dictionary, no jewel. Septuagint Concordance, no jewel. So I sit down and write. Once again, these blind, withering, stupid idiots display their lack of intelligence by messing up the King James Bible, and their arrogant, infidelic, you know, just give them a fit. And when I get through there, I say, now, Lord, help! <laughs> See, I commit myself. You say, by what? By faith. By faith. And then I pick up my concordance, and I see Netson. Earring or no jewel. Flip, 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 flip. Genesis. Go back to Bethel. And they took the earrings out of their ears. And it wasn't a no jewel. It was in the ear. Just like the King James said. 
You say, where'd you get that thing? I got that thing by praying. I'll come down through there and get right in the way, and I'll read where Joseph and, and, uh, and uh, Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his sons, and because he was the son of his old age, and Joseph made him a coat of many colors. I pick up an ASV, different pieces. New ASV, various pieces. RSV, different pieces. Kalich's Hebrew Chaldean, many pieces. Delich, many pieces. Jacinius, many pieces. Septuagint, many pieces. New King James, many pieces. RSV, many pieces. Living Bible, Berkeley, Moffat, Weymouth, Hagar, Peanuts, Charlie Brown, Red Dragon, <laughs> many pieces, many pieces. Once again, they blind stupidity. These arrogant asses make a fool out of themselves and let them fool come out here like that. Now, when I get through, I say, Help! <laughs> you say, Why? Because I've committed myself. I've accepted my faith in what God said He meant and meant what He said, and that's it. And so I pick up there and I get hanging around. I can't find anything. And I work and I work and I work. And I can't find nothing. And everything I say says many pieces, many pieces, many pieces of English is wrongly translated here, and a better translation should be James Fawcett Brown, a better translation should be Ellicott's Commentary, a better translation should be Wycliffe's Commentary, a better translation should be New Bible Commentary, a better translation should be Dumalo, a better translation, 22 commentaries. Every one of them says the King James is wrong. So what do I do? I just <laughs> drop kick him out the window and then say, Lord, I need some help. <laughs> And then I get messing around, and a year later I pick up a National Geographic magazine. I mean, Lord knows what he's doing. And what do I find? I find a color reproduction from ancient Egypt and the inscriptions of a bunch of Syrians coming down to Egypt. And they're coming down to Egypt, and here's old Pharaoh, sit up there at his throne, and he's brown, and all his slaves are alongside him, and they're black. And here come these Assyrians coming into this party to bring a present down to Pharaoh, and here's the leader. And the leader of the Assyrians, Syrians, see where Jacob came from? And he's coming up there, this present in his hand, and lo and behold, he's got this coat. And this coat, every piece is a different piece of cloth, and every different piece has a different color. A coat of many colors. You know what he gave Joseph? He gave him the coat of a leader. Didn't you in that thing over there in Judges chapter 5 where Sisera, maybe Sisera turned for the, uh, for the spoil with a coat of divers' colors, meat for the neck of them that take the spoil? You see that thing over there in 2 Samuel where he said when Ammon raped his sister that she went on and tore her clothes with, for, with such daughter, a clothes for the king's daughter's uh, apparel. It was a coat of many colors. Royalty, royalty, type of Christ. That's why they changed it. They got a spirit of a demon in them. And they're all premillennial Bible believing fundamentalists. They're demon controlled. Amen, amen. You say, where'd you get that from? Prayer. You say, it's just your opinion. That ain't a matter of opinion, that's a matter of revelation. <laughs> Lord, give you those things. Or I want you to pray about the thing. Now I'll tell you something else you need to do. You need to take the thing and try to practice it. You said, well, I've tried to live a holy life, and I just can't make it, and I failed, and I've had to confess my sin again and again. It's the same sin over and over again. And I get sick and tired of going back to the Lord and telling about over You do. <laughs> you get sick and tired of going back to the Lord, do you? <laughs> see how we are? It's old pride, see. I get so tired of going back to the Lord. You do because you're proud. You're stuck on yourself. I mean, if you're up thinking about the thing, you'd be glad you had a chance to come back to the Lord. And he appreciates your company, and you'll appreciate his. Take it and put it into practice. Well, I just can't practice, Brother Ruckman. I'm just, there's a lot of things there I can't do. I know that. A lot of things I can't put into practice. Well, maybe so, but uh, if you can't practice 90% of it, how about 60%? <laughs> if you can't practice 100%, how about uh, 40%? I mean, some is better than nothing, isn't it? I mean, give it a try. Don't go around there and say, well, they drank wine in the Bible, so I'll drink wine too, you know, that kind of thing. All these people, they, may, they wear me out, man. They ate barley in the New Testament. Do you eat barley? <laughs> well, I said, well, Christ drank wine. I'll drink wine. We'll buy some barley bread. That's what they ate in the New Testament. They ate barley in the white stuff you buy down there at the grocery store. 
Somebody's always giving something like that. You know, if God didn't want us to smoke tobacco, what he let it grow for, you know? If God didn't intend for us to smoke tobacco, what he let it grow for? You ever hear people like that, you know? I tell them, well, if God intended for us to fly, he wouldn't have made it so hard to get to the airport. <laughs> oh, come on, folks, where's your sense of humor? I mean, <laughs> I mean, you can't just sit at home, you know, and laugh all the time, home and come to church and give God what's left. You ain't no different here than you were outside of here. Folks got funny ideas. I think they come in a building and does something for them, you know. Weird, you know. <laughs> I think coming to, come to the church building, and suddenly this church building just transformed in a sober, intelligent, active, wide awake, pious, spiritual. Hey man, you're the same bird you were out there walking down the street. You're the same bird you were driving the car this morning. Huh? Get over there. <laughs> same to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, woman driver, you know. <laughs> No, it's a man. Well, his mother taught him how to drive, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> you can take the thing and try to put the thing into practice. Do something with it. Witness. Ask, ask questions about it. When you're out there in a job, you've got a guy you can't witness to and won't listen to you, and a little hard-headed, hard-nosed Catholic has been all her ball, that kind of thing. Instead of getting an argument with him, don't, don't come up to him and say, you blow on that great whore on Seven Hills. Don't start that <laughs> stuff, you know. Say, uh, say, uh, say, uh, you, you ever read the Bible any? They probably lie and say, oh yeah, you know. But it don't matter whether he lies or not. And say, well, what do you think about that verse that says, and get the thing going, see? Talk, put the thing into practice. Get talking about it. I mean, put, put out feelers. Say, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? I always didn't wonder about this verse over here. Well, did you ask your, ask your priest what that thing means? See, get the thing going. You don't have to just get there and just butt nose and get into a big old bloody argument every time you bump heads. I mean, get in there and say, well, you know, I was coming across the verse the other day, you know, it says there's one meter between God and man, and the man cries, Jesus. And if he knows you, he'll say, oh, well, you guys believe that, we don't believe that. Say, well, I know that, everybody got their own belief, but we don't, why don't you do me a favor? See, come it that way. Do me a favor? Well, God, you know, if he professed to be decent, you'll have to say yes. And put him on the spot, mess him up, man. And when the guy says, uh, yeah, sure, you say, would, would you ask your priest what that means? I just, I'm just curious about that. I don't know what they teach about that. Would you do that for me? It don't matter whether he does or whether he doesn't. That thing will get in his crawl. And he may go ask. And then he comes back. Then you got the conversation going again, see? The thing is, get the thing going. Drop a little something here. Drop a little something there. I know a guy, one of, a guy of Christ, one of these plants up here in uh, Flint or Lansing or someplace. I can't get this place straightened out. This is the most screwed up place I've ever seen in my life. The Pontiac, Flint, Lanson, Livonia, Gardenia. It's all just Detroit, as far as I can tell. The whole thing is just Detroit, as far as you can see. But this guy was up here, and he led some guy to Christ. And you know how he did it? He looked at that fellow first time, and the guy just laughed at him and cussed him. And this uh, personal worker was a very uh, wise fellow. And I forget the guy's name he was dealing with. Now, this happened a good many years back, but we'll just call him, uh, we'll just call him Bill. That's good as anything. And so about, he prayed for this fellow for about a month. Now, I've been praying for him about a month. He stopped in there in the, in the plant one day and said, Bill, you been born again yet? And he said, oh, no, go on, you blanky black so-and-so. I'm not enough. They haven't talked me about that mess. And he left him alone. And he prayed for him for about two months. Now, after two months, he came up alongside him during lunch to one time and said, uh, Oh, by the way, Bill, I know you don't appreciate me asking this, but I've been praying for you. I'm kind of curious. You been born again yet? Oh, you know, hell no. <laughs> and then he went away and prayed for him about two months. They came back to him one day after he had a little accident. You know, you pray for him, sometimes, you know, business picks up. <laughs> and after a little accident, he came up alongside him and said, uh, said, I don't mean to bother you, Bill. He said, I don't mean to offend you anything, but uh, have you been born again yet? And this time, Bill says, no, I haven't been born again yet. See, that's an improvement. Progress. <laughs> Prayed for him about another month, came up alongside him, said, uh, Bill, you've been born again yet? No, I haven't. Prayed for him. This, this thing took about a year and a half. Now, after about a year and a half, he came up, put his arm around him one time during a lunch break, and found him in the back and said, Bill, I've been praying for you every day for a year and a half. Have you been born again yet? And this time he's got his head down and he says, 
No, I've been born again now. <laughs> Two weeks later, let him to Christ. Amen. You know what that thing is? That's putting that book, that's applying that book. And that's the last thing you've got to do with that thing. You have to apply it. I know you used to take it in and take it in and take it in if you don't give it out. Now, some of us in the ministry, in full-time ministry, have more opportunities than some of you do. I mean, for about 38 years, that's just about all I've been doing. It's just getting it out, getting it out, getting it out. And let me make myself clear here. It's not my job to make it acceptable. It's my job to make it available. And that's your job. If you're a child of God, your job is to make that book available to people where they can get it. Your job is to make that, put out that word where they can get what God said. Now, if they don't like it, okay, okay, it's a free country, help yourself. But it's your job to make it available. And the only way you can do that thing is by applying that thing and putting that thing out. I like that Reverend Whipple. He was an English preacher back in about 1880 that went to the house one day to be with a very sick little girl about 15 years old, and she asked for him to come and pray with her at the bedside. She had a devil for a mother who cared nothing about the Word of God at all and cared nothing about Reverend Whipple. And Reverend Whipple carried a cane with him, had a slight limp, and carried a cane with him, and he went to that place and started in the house. And when he started in the house, this girl's mother met him at the door and said, All right, she said, you can come in, but there needn't be any praying in here. She said, I've got a butcher knife and I can use it. And he went back there in the room and counseled the little old girl for a while, and he said, Now we're going to have a word of prayer. About that time, that mother glared at him, and Whipple got up and took his cane and said, Madam, he said, I want you to know something. He said, I can pray just as well with one eye open as both eyes shut, and you pull that knife, and I'll beat your brains out with this cane. <laughs> and brother, he prayed, and she didn't do anything. <laughs> now, it might not have been very acceptable to her, but it was available. <laughs> You know, uh, a modelish has a thing he does, uh, he did up in, uh, in uh, Rochester, New York, which I always thought was a very good thing, and I've never had my own people do it, because we we always had good crowds, and we couldn't afford to get buses, because we'd bring in so many people, we couldn't sit them down. But if I was a fellow just starting out a new work and getting something going, I'd do what uh, Brother Modelish does. And Brother Modelish has what he calls a around the walls of Jericho campaign. You know what he does? And this is to make all your members use the Word of God. He tells every member of that church, you take the block that you live on, whatever block that is, that you take that block and you go around that block uh, and put a track in every door in that block. And don't, uh, don't deal with the people. Don't, don't, don't stand around the door and wait for them. Slip it in there. And slip you on a track that doesn't have your church number on it, church name on anything. Just a good gospel track, you know, that slip in there. And then he said, uh, the next week, you go around the block and give them another one. No name, no address on it, just, just a track. And you do that for a month. Oh, no, no, seven times. You go around there seven times. This is the Jericho campaign. <laughs> and you go around there seven times around that block and take that, uh, those tracks and put them out there seven times. And then he says, the seventh time, which would be the eighth week, he said, you go around and put a thing on the door with your name and address and telephone number on it, and you write down there, I am the coot that's been putting these things in your door. <laughs> See, this identifies all your members real quick, puts them on the spot, and said, my name and address at such, such a place, and I'm concerned about your soul, and if you'd like an appointment, I'd be glad to come to see you at your convenience. Telephone number. Now, let me tell you something. You get 500 members hitting 500 blocks like that, boy, you will stir the dust. But you see, that's applying it. And that's the Christian taking his side with the Word so they identify, you see. I mean, those people, you know, the first couple of weeks, they get that, who's this nut passing out these things? And if I think I can't stand, somebody put in your door, doesn't leave a name. They say, well, that's for a whole week, or for a whole seven weeks. And then the eighth week, here comes your name. I'm the guy, I'm the guilty party. You say, boy, you that, you sure going to get here to Columbia. Yeah, you will from some of them. Some of them, but they'll phone you up and cuss you out and find out where you are and so that's the guy that did it, you know. And I'll tell you something else. Some really think about it. Some really think about it. And one or two of them, the first time they have trouble, your telephone's going to ring. Well, you the fellow that put this stuff in my door, you well, I'm going to see you for a minute. And you got the opening. The thing is application. 
You know, years ago, I have a lot more time than I got right now, and I can't really alibi about it. I have time to witness, you know, but all kinds of things come up. When I get in the airplane, I don't witness much as I used to. I don't witness much as I used to because I put cotton in my ears. I couldn't hear the guy talk anyway. I put cotton in my ears because after 38 years in those planes, those decibels just blowing my brains out, man. You take those, did you know you can put cotton in your ears and put your finger over that cotton and you hear every word that guy's saying that PA system? You talk about decibels. That thing is such a roar of, of guy who's a deaf mute at every word that guy is saying. <laughs> you never heard such a thing. So I don't get the opportunities like I used to. And years ago, when I was a young man first starting out in the ministry, I had all my time, I mean all my time, that I wasn't actually studying in school, just to walk up and down the hills in North South Carolina, which I did, and witness, and witness and witness. I used to take a Bible and just go literally door to door, and literally house to house, and do it by the hour up there in the hills, and just take those hills and go across them, hour by hour. And as the years went on, I got more responsibilities and had to deal with more with Christians. And God wanted me to deal more with Christians, and I just threw me in a bunch of Christians. And I've just been around Christians ever since. They're a trial to live with, I'll tell you. <laughs> I, and, and you know, I, you know, you've got Christians in this country, you don't even think I'm saved. Really, honest to God. They said, no man can talk like that and be saved, you know. I know how they, I know how they talk. Let me tell you something, it's been just a big trial for me as it has for some of you. I watched some of you through the years, watch you just mess around 10, 15, 20, 25 years, never do nothing for the Lord, except warm a pew. And I wondered about you, too. That thing needs to be applied. And back in those days, I had a lot more time than I have now, and I did a lot more with this than I do now, but I got, I thank God I got it done when I had the time. And you take, now, now it comes up all the time, Christians, Christians, Christians. It's papers are great. If Christians want to have fellowship with you, and Christians want to talk with you, and Christians want to be with you, and contact with the pastors, and people want to study the Bible, you take down there in Pensacola, I got on a, 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 a talk show the other day, it's on a station called Station Blab, <laughs> B-L-A-B, <laughs> and all that thing has all day long is community service programs that talk about issues. And somebody got me on there. And I got on there, and the, re the fellow in charge of that thing was a great big old fat Roman Catholic, the old boy who was a master of ceremonies, and he'd just been saved for about two months. We got in that thing, and they started putting in the phone calls and evolution. He hogged the whole time and wouldn't let them ask questions. He won't ask me questions about the Bible. <laughs> and for one hour in front of that place, with the telephone trying to ring, that guy was saying, well, what about this, and what about that, and what about this, and what about that? I'm just sitting there, flip, 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 and putting the Bible in front of the camera, right on the scripture, see, putting the thing out. <laughs> but that's the kind of thing I get into, see. I get in the thing, you know, where I'm on there, and I figure I'm having a chance to do some evangelistic work, win some of the Christ. Instead, I get a Christian who wants to learn something about the book, <laughs> and it goes on and on and on. But I thank God back those early years, I sure spent some time doing it. Boy, I'll tell you, man, I've been down in Greenville, South Carolina, downtown many a night, go down there at 10 o'clock and put out tracks at midnight, there wasn't a soul in the street. Back in those days, all went to bed at 10 o'clock. I remember one night going down there, a buddy of mine, we went back to the car and started to come home, and a buddy of mine had gone down the, around the corner, and he'd seen a fellow standing there, he had his back to the street like this, looking at the store window, the store was closed, and uh, he had his back to the window, and this fellow I had him back to the street, and this friend of mine came up and said, uh, uh, would you care to have a track? And the guy didn't say anything, and he didn't turn around. Didn't turn around. And uh, this friend of mine took a track and reached around this way, and the fellow standing like this, put up one hand like this, took the track, didn't say thank you, he kept on looking in the store window. My buddy went on past a few more tracks around here and there, and about the time he figured that uh, everything was pretty well closed up and there wasn't any sense in, you know, doing any more, he decided to come back to the car, and he came back to the car where I was, and then he said, I think I better go back and see that fellow I gave that uh, track to back there. And I said, uh, why? I said, I don't know. He said, he, he, uh, going through his stuff there, he had something there in his hand looked like a little blood. This fellow reached around, so he went back there and went, came up alongside the store this fellow was. This fellow was still standing there, had his back toward him. Had his back toward him, and he came up to him and said, uh, Sir, did you read that tractor gave you? 
And that guy was standing like this and turned around like this, and he had blood all over his hands and all over his wrists and all over his pants, and turned down his shoes, had a jackknife in his hand. He'd been sore on his wrist there, trying to get enough nerve to kill himself. Had blood all over him. And he turned around to this buddy of mine, he said, Do you believe there's a God? And let him to Christ right out there on the street. Amen. You know what that is? That's application, boy. That's application. Not just a simple old thing, get out of the street at night and hit some of these birds with a gospel track. You ever do that? You see, we're drawing pair. I'm drawing a guy staying with the book. Staying with the book. You don't give it up. You don't give it up just uh, because the rest of the people give it up. You keep on with it and stay with it. 1986, you say, well, if the Lord tarries, stay with the book. You say, getting up there near the time. Yeah, I'm getting up there near the time. Uh, I don't think, frankly, it's going to last that long. <laughs> I think the Lord is going to come before that. But if he doesn't, you know what you're supposed to do? Stay with the book. The bias Bible says, for man meditates in that word day and night, he'll be like a tree planted by the waters, whose leaf stays green and bears fruit, and whose leaf fadeth not. Fadeth not. You know, folks, the book we carry, is this book we carry? That's the book that carries us. You see this thing I got in my hand? That's the best thing I've had in my hand all day long. Right there. It's alive. It's alive. The Word of God. Do you ever wonder why they have to keep changing those textbooks at school every other year? Haven't you got somewhere in your house a big cardboard box with all the textbooks in it that your kids bought home in school? They have to keep changing them, changing them, changing them. You don't have to keep changing them because they're not scientific. You know, we don't have to change that book. Because it's scientific and doesn't have to have one thing in it change. It's just the way it is. Apply it, apply it, apply it. The average Bible has 1,200 pages in it. I know these big print Bibles have a lot more than that. That's because it takes more. they got some 14, 1,500 in them. I know a school field reference Bible has more than that because of the notes. But an average text Bible, just a plain text, has 1,200 pages in it. Does that have some? 1,200 pages. Read that thing through, you read uh, three pages a day, 30 pages a day, you can get it read it through in a month. 15 pages a day, once every two months. Eight pages a day, once every four months. Eight pages a day, you can get through there three times in a year. Eight pages. That's four pieces of paper, brethren, with writing on both sides of them. Four. One two, three, or four. Three times a year. You've been saved 20 years. You should have been through there 60 times. Every word in it. If you're a dog slow reader with an IQ of 110, you should have been through there 60 times in 20 years. Don't look me in the face and tell me you can't read four pieces of paper both sides in a day. The thing is, you don't. <laughs> Get mighty quiet again here, preacher. I think I done quit preaching and going to meddling. <laughs> but I ain't going to worry about it. I'll tell you what you do with the Bible. You use it. You read it. You memorize it. You pray over it. You practice it. And you apply it. That's what to do for the Word of God. Years ago, a little blind girl uh, uh, that had been reading the Bible and reading by Braille, got the place where the tips of her fingers got so insensitive she couldn't read the Braille anymore with her fingers. And she kissed her Bible goodbye and said, Dear Bible, I've loved you and read you so much these years. Of course, read it by Braille. And she said, No, I'm not going to be able to read you anymore. I'm going to have to put you away. And with tears in her eyes, she picked up that book and kissed that book. And when she kissed that book, she felt the Braille with her lips. And she said, Oh, I can read it with my lips. <laughs> So she got reading it that way, got reading that way. Now, I like to got my eyes knocked out in a hockey game a couple of years back, and there had been much good sense, and getting worse all the time. And I reached the place for all the reading I've got to do, and all the typing I've got to do, and all the proofreading I've got to do, and all the papers I've got to grade, and all that stuff. I ain't complaining, just telling you what I've got to do. And with that kind of stuff right there, I'm getting the place where I can't afford again to read that book like I used to. But I ain't going to give it up. 
I read it through, through myself on tape. I got my own tape of the whole book. And I lie there and go through the thing on the tape now and pick it up. I must confess, there's some things I find there listening to it I didn't get when I was reading it <laughs> going through there. But I don't tend to give it up. I don't tend to give it up when I'm blind as a bat and deaf as a post. The answer thy word giveth light, he giveth understanding to the simple. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, bless the message this morning. Speak to your people about these matters. And if any under conviction, may they act upon their conviction. Do something about it. And I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Let's, let's do this this morning. We'll have a, I guess we've got a little time here. What time is it, brother? How, how much time do you want? Okay. Let's have a song or something. Let you stand and get the slack out and let's stand and sing something. And then we'll have a little open forum here, question and answer if you'd like to, and let you ask some questions and try to give the answers. Now, what are you saying here this morning is James. James says, be a doer.